radiometric dating. To understand radiometric dating, you've got to understand a little bit about chemistry. It's pretty tough to teach chemistry in a few minutes, but I will try to give you just a little gist of it. Matter, that which we see and feel, matter is made up of elements, and there are approximately a hundred elements, a little over, 90-some naturally occurring elements, elements that you're familiar with. This picture shows the table of elements, and if you ever took chemistry, you certainly had the periodic table of elements. To save space, they have symbols or abbreviations for the elements. And some of these things are in Latin. They're usually one or two letters. For example, H is hydrogen, helium, lithium, I can read the beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Let me pick a few others that you would know. Probably sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc. These are elements. They're the basic building blocks of matter. So you have elements, and then you have compounds. Compounds are where two or more elements come together to form a molecule. Water is a compound, H2O. Two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. They combine to form a molecule. That's compounds. So you have elements, hundreds of elements. You have thousands of compounds. Organic compounds, chemistry of carbon compounds, that's more or less the living cells are normally made up of carbon compounds. So there's elements, there's compounds, and then of course there's mixtures of the two. That's what matter is made of. Now let's talk about atomic theory. The theory is this, in atomic theory, if I took that little piece of aluminum and I tore that in half, then I took that piece and I tore it in half. Then I took this piece and I tore it in half. Then I took this piece and I tore it in half. Now obviously my fingers are such that I'm almost reaching my limit. But if I could keep tearing that, and if I had such an ability to tear to get to the very smallest particle of aluminum that has the properties of aluminum, that's known as a what? An atom. No one has ever seen an atom. It's the smallest particle of element. So there are copper atoms, nickel atoms, hydrogen atoms, and so forth. They still have the property of that element. Now, it is further thought by atomic theory that the atom itself is made up of some subatomic particles. I'm going to give you the major ones. It is felt that an atom has a small nucleus where most of the mass concentrated of protons and neutrons. Surrounding that are electrons. An atom is determined by the number of protons. For example, every carbon atom has six protons. Every oxygen atom has eight protons. Every hydrogen atom, one proton. So that's what distinguishes one element from another, according to atomic theory, is the number of protons that it has. It turns out that different forms of atoms can exist. They can have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Two atoms with the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons, are known as isotopes. And I had to do that to get you into carbon-14 dating, because there are several isotopes of carbon, two of which are involved in the carbon-14 dating method. It's carbon-14 and carbon-12. They both have six protons. That's what makes it carbon. But the carbon-14 has eight neutrons. The carbon-12 has six neutrons. Where do I get carbon-12? Six plus six. There's 12 particles in the nucleus. So six plus six, the atomic... The numbering system here would be the sum of the protons and the neutrons. Carbon-14, six protons, eight neutrons. It's called carbon-14 because it's sum of six plus eight is 14. Now, it turns out that some isotopes are not what are called stable. They don't last long. They give off radiation and they convert back to other elements. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. Carbon-12 is a stable isotope. In other words, it won't last forever as carbon-14. 
So a radioactive isotope is one that decays by giving off some kind of radiation. There are various forms of radiation. There's alpha radiation, which is really the nucleus of a helium atom. There's beta radiation, that's felt to be like an electron, and then there's gamma radiation. But they give up some kind of radiation, and when they do, they change. Carbon-14 is used in dating former things that lived. In other words, trees, bones, and something like that. That's when you use carbon-14 dating. As I mentioned earlier, study of carbon chemistry, organic chemistry, lots of times has to do with living things, not always. If you want to date rock, you don't use carbon-14 dating method. You use two methods primarily, the potassium-argon dating method and the uranium-lead dating are the two most common methods of dating rocks. Now, there is a term that you should know, and that's called the half-life. Potassium, to decay to argon, if you had a pound of potassium-40 and it decayed to half a pound, the time involved for it to go to a pound to a half a pound, that's called the half-life. For potassium-40 to decay in half, they estimate that the half-life would take 1.3 billion years. Now, I ask this question, who's been around measuring it for that long? The carbon-14 to carbon-12 is something like 5,760 is the half-life. In other words, if you have a pound of carbon-14, it would decay to a half a pound. That would take 5,760 years or so. If that half pound decays to quarter pound, that would be another 5,730 years. So the total to go from a pound to a quarter pound would be like 11,500, whatever, twice 5,760 plus or minus 30 years. Okay, so it's important for you to know that carbon-14 is not used to date rocks. It's used to date bones and trees and so forth. Potassium, argon, uranium, lead are the methods used to date rock. Now, how is radioactivity used to determine the age of a sample? Well, if they think they know the half-life and they compare it to the amount of radioactive substance in the sample that originally they assumed it had, then they try to attempt on that basis to calculate how old it was. Uh, this is kind of complicated. Let me give you a, a simpler illustration. Let's say a person walked in this room with a candle burning. And you could tell that it probably was shorter than it originally was. But how long has the candle been burning? Well, to try to assume how long the candle's been burning, you have to assume several things. First of all, you have to assume how long was the candle to start with. And obviously, if it was only five inches long and it's now four and three quarters, it probably hadn't been burning very long. But if it originally was ten inches long, then you'd been burning a lot longer period of time. So you assume you know how long the candle was to start with. Also, you have to assume that the rate of burning was constant if you try to determine it. You know, maybe the candle's tapered and it burned faster at the top than the bottom. So that's another assumption. And then the third thing we don't really know was maybe it had been lit, blown out, lit, blown out, lit, blown out. So you really can't tell. These are the kind of assumptions that are involved in radioactive dating also. The dating of something by radioactive dating method. It doesn't matter whether you're doing carbon-14, uranium lead, potassium argon. You've got to assume the amount of both the radioactive isotope and the decay product at the same time. In other words, the carbon-14 they would assume they know that when it died, it had a certain amount of carbon-14 and carbon-12 in it. In other words, they know what the ratio was. In the uranium-lead, they assume there was no lead in the beginning. Well, I asked this question, couldn't God have created lead as well as uranium? That's kind of a ridiculous assumption. But you've got to know the relative amounts of the parent and the daughters, what they call it, the, the radioactive thing they call the parent, the stable isotope that ends up at the daughter, the parent-daughter isotope. A second assumption that is made is that the only change in concentration from when it originally was to now occurred by radioactive decay. Let's take this example for a bone. If a bone's been in the soil for a long period of time, couldn't some carbon-14, say, have been washed in or washed out? 
if you have uranium lead or potassium argon, couldn't some of those chemicals have leached out? That's the second assumption that's made. The third assumption that's made is that the rate of decay is constant. Who's been observing the potassium argon decaying for 1.3 billion years? Or even the carbon-14? Who's been observing it for 5,760 or 30 years, whatever, plus or minus 30 years? Who's been observing that that long? Well, they haven't really. Radioactive dating is relatively new in the last 100 years or so. So these three assumptions, and I would like for you to know these because when people say, oh, oh well, radioactive dating says it's, this rock is so old, or, or this bone, we found this fossil now, and it's 17,000 years. Well, first of all, a lot of times they try to date it by the rock layer it's found in. You remember seeing that. That's circular reasoning. The only other type of thing is this radiometric dating. Now, are these methods accurate? Well, let's give some examples. Well, they have taken the shells of living snails and analyzed them and found out they're 27,000 years old. Well, they're living. Okay, that's not very good. A live clam was estimated to be thousands of years old. Some seal carcasses that they knew had been killed less than 30 years was dated at 4,600 years. And some freshly killed were in dates of 1,300 years. In the book, I mentioned a eruption that occurred in the Pacific Islands off Hawaii. They know this eruption from history took place about 1801, so it was approximately 200 years ago. They did some potassium argon dating methods on it, and it determined those rocks to be between 160 million and 3 billion years old. That's quite a variation from 200 years. Since I've written the book, I've come across this. Steve Austin did some samples from Mount St. Helens, which we know even the day it erupted. You know, it was May 18, 1980. Radioactive dating of the lava dome at Mount St. Helens gives an age for the formation of that lava between 0.34 and 2.8 million years. That's pretty inaccurate. So what conclusion can you make? Well, dates obtained by radiometric dating may possibly be an interesting geophysical exercise, but they don't determine the age of the earth, they don't determine the age of bones and so forth. They maybe are the best they can do, but they aren't very accurate.